Where's my vlog, Mike? Uh... It's, it's been, as far as I can tell, it's been a month. Yep. And I have to say, I'm severely, severely disappointed in you <laughs> after all of the lectures I have had to receive behind the scenes about the importance of schedules for growing podcasts. And, and it's like hundreds and hundreds of lectures I have received about how the schedule is super important. Mm -hmm. You must stick to the schedule. Yep. We always have to upload on the schedule. Like this is... In my mind, this is like one of the most important things to you. And then here we go. We have this we have this vlog that you've started. You just passed a momentous moment in the vlog. Where where is a new episode? Nowhere to be seen. Disappointing, Mike. I am working on one. It's that's not uploaded. That's not what I'm hearing. House stuff. It's really getting in the way. It's like mm. every minute that I'm not doing my actual job, I'm dealing with something house related. It's it's annoying me, honestly. Like I'm frustrated about it because um, I, I, it's something that I really do want to do more with, and I think I've shown it like so far that like I, I it's something I want to keep doing because I produced a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But it's just been the case of right now. I'm just every spare moment that is free. I feel like I'm talking to a plumber or <laughs> going to a furniture store or packing boxes. So mm -hmm. I've kind of I've kind of had to put it on ice a little bit. Interesting, I'm working on a on a on a vlog episode which will be out not too long after this episode comes out hopefully, which is kind of like addressing that, right? So talking mm -hmm. about the fact that the vlog hasn't been there. And then actually the good thing about the vlog is I can show people why. I can show people Cortex Cottage. Ooh. And and show them what it is that's been taking my time. <laughs> like our friend the boiler <laughs> so yeah it's it, i have to say like it, this is one of those things which is, has been a frustration for me um because it's a side project and a creative outlet that i'm very excited about mm -hmm. but life has got in the way and mm -hmm. it's been really annoying for me because this is something that has not happened to me before like with all of my other side projects like when i was podcasting on the side i never let anything get in the way like, mm -hmm. I always just got on with it. So this has been particularly difficult for me because I haven't been able to put the focus in that I've wanted to. And I also feel like I'm kind of letting people down in a way, mm -hmm. um, even though like no one is saying this to me, like no, nobody's really being like, oh, what, you know, except for you. I was going to say, there's one person who is, actually. There's one person. <laughs> and, and when I said it, like, I don't think to myself that, that there isn't anybody in the world that doesn't want it. Like, I'm not, I'm, when I think of that, it's not like, oh, nobody's saying it because nobody wants it. Like, I don't actually, mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. Um, but it's just, you know, I'm not getting people that are super upset about it. I have this, like, feeling of, you know, there are people out in the world that, that are enjoying this and I'm not living up to my end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. I, ha I have a lot of sympathy for that situation. It's it's interesting to hear you say that that this is this is the first time that like a side project has had to be put a little bit on ice because of of just the rest of the world intruding, and that, that definitely is a thing that happens. And I think especially given the from my perspective extraordinary number of podcasts that you do and you need to keep all of that going yeah. while you are also attempting to buy a house and deal with plumbers and electricians and boilers and falling pipes and all the rest of that it's it's not yeah. surprising that like something has to give and this is the thing that has to give yeah and i have to keep running my business when i was working for the man mm -hmm. i could just take my foot off the gas mm -hmm. for a bit you know this is something we were talking about when I first started on the house buying process, right? If like buying a house becomes like your job. Right. But I felt like I was just working two full time jobs because I wasn't able to take the pressure off because I have this business that I run. And if I don't run the business or if I don't run my parts of the business, they just don't happen. And that's not something that can happen. So that this is where I've been right now. Like I've had other things, like other other podcasts that I've had to put on a little bit of just a short break, you know, things that are just kind of more fun things for me, or I've had to skip episodes. Like I've I've had my co-hosts, I've had people fill in for me. Like this mm -hmm. has been, it's just been a weird time. Like it turns out, turns out that buying a house is is really time intensive. <laughs> but we're nearly through the woods on the the big parts, right? Like then it's just this just becomes part of my life. But like the idea of like getting a house ready to move in and then moving in. 
Mm-hmm. Once that's done, I feel like I'm going to be in a in a in a much better situation than I am now. So I'm excited to get the vlog up and running again. Like mm-hmm. you know, talking about that, like the office, mega office is is painted now. Oh, and the broadband's in. Well. What more could you possibly need? Exactly, which is why I'm now working on a video. But like, I, I've, I've, the, the, the office is being set up in certain ways with video in mind. Like when I originally started thinking about what my office was going to look like, it was what is the perfect office to record podcasts in. Mm-hmm. But now I'm also thinking about it, like from a visual perspective, like what do I want to be in the office? Because I, I have these ideas of like it becoming the main place where you'll see a lot of the vlog stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like in this office and the things that will be on the walls behind me, you know, like that is all like part of the visual idea of how the the vlog will look after that, which I'm excited about. I feel like for vloggers, that is probably a a pretty big visual indicator or like what is it that they wish to visually convey about Mm -hmm. themselves is what's in the background of the vlog. And I, I don't know for a fact, but I am, I am very willing to bet that a lot of people's like, oh, look at my casual home in the background. Like there is nothing casual about that arrangement, right? Like everything is set up to be like, oh yeah, I just turned on a camera and you just happen to be seeing all of my cool stuff in the background. Like I think, I think that is, that is really like um, a visual indicator. Like what do you wish to convey about yourself to the audience as to like what is behind you when you are talking to camera in just whatever scenario you're going to set up is like, this is my default place for recording and talking to camera. There's going to be something behind you. What is it going to be? Yeah, because I've been frustrated that like in all of the stuff where I'm recording at home, there isn't anything behind me that is anything to do with me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not my decoration. It's not any of my stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just like the stuff is in this house. So... I've I've got a nice blue wall mm-hmm. that I'm going to be putting some artwork on and then I'm having these shelving units put in where I'm going to put all my fun knickknacks, you know? Mm. I'm, exci- I'm excited. Fun knickknacks. Got, I got a sit-stand desk today, Gray. Oh, did you? Yeah, I went to Ikea today. So you got a, you got a desk that you can move between two positions. That's yeah. what you're saying? Between yeah. sitting and standing? Yeah, it's a, an electric one that Ikea make. Oh. So that's hmm. good. I'm excited about that. Um, I also that thought like very exciting. that will be good because I could set a camera up on it and just like raise the desk. Who needs a tripod? <laughs> <laughs> just raise the desk. The desk is your tripod. The desk is my tripod. And but that just you know launches into the idea of like I went to IKEA today. Oh, that's a horrible place, man. It's, I I don't agree with you. You think IKEA is a horrible place? I always like going to IKEA. So here's the thing. Uh I was really excited about it this morning. Mhm. And then just as the day continued to progress, I just just, just it would just become more frustrating. Tell me, what 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 was becoming more frustrating? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, like this is very specific to to me, but I just had some bad interactions with the staff there. Um mm-hmm. they just weren't very they just weren't very they just weren't very nice to me. Uh <laughs> And they would they would, you know, they were saying things to me like like I should know them. Mm-hmm. My desk, right? It said uh, there was a little sign on the on the desk that said, "Talk to somebody about this." Like you can't pick this yourself, because mm-hmm. you know, like with if anybody that doesn't know with IKEA, with a lot of their stuff, like you choose what you want, then you go down into the the best part of IKEA, which is the warehouse section, where you get to pull big boxes off the shelves. Right. That's the part I actually really like, uh, <laughs> because you just drive these big carts around and you just pull these boxes out of a warehouse because it's super weird. Like mm-hmm. you don't do this anywhere else. Uh, so I just assumed, right, we'll go down to the warehouse and we'll ask someone and they will get it. I just thought, it's big boxes. I don't know. So we go and talk to the guy and he's like, no, you have to talk to somebody upstairs about that. And I'm like, well, I, why? And he's like, oh, because it says on the desk you have to talk to someone. And I was like, well, you're someone. <laughs> he's like, no, I assume somebody upstairs. And we just had a bit of a um, a heated back and forth Oh, Mike, you can't fight the machine, Mike, right? If the guy guy says he's not the guy, you have to go and talk to the other guy. It's just, you should know this better than anyone. You can't fight the machine. He ended up doing the order for us, though, Gray. (laughs) Okay. So, you know, that's what I'm going to say. We'll we'll, we'll see what arrives. (laughs) We wanted to get everything delivered, Mm -hmm. but they will only deliver certain things. Like, if it can go in a blue bag, one of their big blue bags, they won't deliver it. Hmm. So so we ended up 
there's a bunch of boxes arriving home tomorrow, and then we had to bring this huge blue bag full of the little items home. It's fr- frustrating. Yeah, yeah, your IKEA experience. It was not good. Doesn't doesn't sound great. No, it does. It doesn't sound great. I've never had that kind of experience at IKEA, but also, whenever my wife and I go, we we do have a uh, <laughs> I don't know how to put it, but like optimized for gray experience at ikea <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because there are it, it, there are three phases to ikea there's uh at least the one that we go to there's the there's like the upper floor which is all the showroom stuff yep which i do think is fun to walk around and you know, they have their little layout and you can find little secret yep. shortcuts around and you can see how everything looks it's like okay this is great i like this this layer everything is arranged nice and neatly like my wife and i got essentially our whole kitchen arranged you know by by looking at all the kitchens on that top level like this is great uh which you said the the warehouse level that is fun this is the logistics level this is where ikea makes their margins level yeah like it, you know that's that's satisfying it's like ooh, we're, we're hunting for these different things and we're putting them on a big tray that's great there is however the worst part of ikea which is not the showroom area but downstairs, what to me, in my mind, is just filed under the room with 10 million decisions. Yeah, this is, I think, what they call the market. Yeah, yeah, that, sound, that sounds familiar. But it's like, would you like to look at 40 different types of spoons? Right? Would, would you like yeah, to look at exactly. 17 different types of placemats? Here are 15 different types of candle holders. And what my wife and I have learned is that this is not a place for gray that I should not mm. go here because it ends it ends up being that that I use up all of my decision making ability on the top level and by the time we get down there it's like I can't handle this there are yeah. too many decisions to make and from my perspective they're all too small that I like I can't bring myself to care about i think my problems of everything that happened from warehouse onward mm-hmm. was because of the marketplace yeah yeah the marketplace is is not necessarily a good it place. was just wasn't a great part where it's like well we're gonna get this thing but we need it in this color but it doesn't match with this and then we just you know it just it's not i, I don't think it's my scene there is the restaurant though which i enjoy yes but this is this is why when we go to ikea what happens is when we get to the the area of 10 million decisions, <laughs> what really happens is now it's restaurant time for Gray. And I go get some meatballs. You get put in the playpen. <laughs> right, exactly. Like <laughs> I go get some meatballs. And then it actually works out really well because when my wife is done in in that section, which she can handle much better than I possibly can, when it's over, if there's any like major decisions or things that she can't decide over... It's like, okay, I've had some food, I've recharged a little bit, and then I can make 10 quick executive decisions about, like, this one or this one, this one or this one, this one or this one. But, I, like, I cannot deal with the level mm. one of this. It's just, like, there's just too many things, and they all seem too similar. So that that's, that's the way to get through IKEA. It's a problem, because, like, I want to be there helping, and I want to be involved in it and all that stuff. Yeah, see, that's that's your mistake. But it takes a lot out of me. That's your mistake. Yeah. To the point where I will get really angry with people uh, when they when they don't give me the the uh, the customer service that I like. Yeah, but that's but that's exactly it. Like you're you're going to be super grumpy after having to make a ton of decisions. Like th- this is just an unavoidable thing. This is like a reproducible under laboratory conditions kind of thing that like just give people lots of decisions and, th- and they become frustrated. So just try to avoid yeah. that as much as possible. <laughs> what I found really interesting though for these, these two people in Ikea is neither of them rose to my anger. They must see this a lot. <laughs> I yeah, imagine sure everybody do. in this area is used to people that are very angry and upset. Right, coming bleary-eyed out of the marketplace, yeah. right? <laughs> Holding four different candle holders in their hand. Yeah, it's it's this is I'm sure they see this all day long. <laughs> I did wonder what a gray IKEA experience would would be like. And now you know. Now I know. Yeah, it's great. I don't mind going to IKEA at all. <laughs> Today's episode of Cortex is supported by Hover, the best way to buy and manage domain names. Hey, did you know that over 100 million .com domain names are already registered and a new domain is registered every single second? 
When you think of an idea, you need to find a great domain name before somebody else snatches it up. Hover makes it incredibly easy to quickly register your own .com domain. Instead of making you opt out of page and page of add-ons that you don't want or need, Hover only offers domains and emails so you can quickly secure your domain and get back to working on your great idea. Hover is known for their no wait, no hold, no transfer phone service, so when you call, a real live human being is ready to help. Plus, they have great online tutorials, email, and live chat support too. Those .com domains, if you have an idea for something and you can grab that .com, that is so valuable. And as I mentioned earlier, every second somebody is registering a new one. You want to find that .com domain name for your idea and you want to do it quickly. So go to hover.com and use the promo code OFFICEMATE, or one word, O-F-F-I-C-E-M-A-T-E, OFFICEMATE at checkout and you will get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you so much to Hover for their support of Cortex and Relay FM. I am excited about setting all the office up, though. Are you going to build it yourself? The IKEA stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good. People Good. will know how well this went because my current plan is to take a time lapse of me putting my desk together. Oh, okay. For the vlog. For the vlog. It's all for the vlog. <laughs> well, this is what I was wondering before was when you were saying like oh there's all of these delays in your life and and the house is causing all of these problems that are pushing back the vlog i was thinking yes but also aren't these all opportunities to film like has mike gotten to the level of vlogginess where he's going to be filming the plumber that comes to his house and talking with that guy see i don't want to i don't want to do that plus it would have just ended up being like just sorrow and despair Mm -hmm. you know as as like i just the situation worsened yeah, but you should get to the level, Mike, where you're just filming everything and then you're you're pulling it together. Right? I don't think I ever want to do that. Like, <laughs> I really don't feel that way. You know, like yeah. the, the idea of filming everything, everything always in my life. No, you don't want to be that? No. You don't want to be having a Canon 5D on a gorilla stand yeah. in your hand every day, all day? That's not what you uh, want to do? You know, like the, the uh, reference, like look at Casey Neistat, right? He just gave up his vlog. Like I can imagine, I can't imagine, I can't imagine living that way, Mm -hmm. doing that every day. It it really seems just like a a not fun way to make your living. Well, it's it's interesting because (laughs) surprisingly huge news that that Casey Neistat decided to give up his vlog. It's massive. Like yeah, you know, it is in in the the frame of YouTube. It's yeah. like the one of the most like the fastest rising YouTube creators of all time, probably right. Like his kind of rise to prominence was incredibly fast from yeah. where he was to now, and he's kind of come, become like crown prince of YouTube because he's very like it seems like just from watching his vlog, like he has been like a pseudo spokesperson for them. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to see, but it's it's like he is the golden child. Yeah of youtube probably because he doesn't edit together videos that depict youtube board meetings as hitler nazi rallies like pewdiepie does exactly right which is an editorial choice that pewdiepie has made but also might explain why it doesn't feel like he is so much the golden child as far as youtube is concerned but yeah in, in the past year it feels like youtube has wanted to show off or mention the existence of casey neistat at every conceivable opportunity that that they that he is like their unofficial spokesperson uh, and i think that has that has been very interesting and you are right that he is you know got to be one of the fastest growing channels in the last year it's just phenomenal it's absolutely phenomenal it just says a lot to me because you know i think we're going to talk about analytics a little bit later on in this episode but you know whilst we've spoken about the fact that youtube ad rates are not amazing if you have a video that goes up every day that has like 3 million views a day. I know. It, that's going to add up. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That, that starts to add up. Yeah. So just my <laughs> thing, like the way I've been thinking about this is like, that shows how hard it is to do what he did because he's leaving, a, he's, he's leaving behind a lot of money. Now I don't know what he's going into, you know, um, I expect that he's probably going back to do a little bit more of what he did before vlogging. Mm-hmm. which was like advertising type stuff. Mm-hmm. 
because he seemed to start moving into that a lot more. Like he was, it seems like he was doing a lot of work with Samsung. Yeah, but it it it's like you know to tie it back around like that's no, I I don't think I could ever live my life like that. Like I like making YouTube videos about specific things. Um, I like coming up with ideas of things to do, and I'm in a vlog style. Because that's mm-hmm. just, for me right now, that's the stuff that I can conceptualize. But I want to do different things as well. You know, like mm-hmm. I want to try and make better looking technology product review videos as well. Like that's something that I want to do. You know, like I really love that style of YouTubing as well. Like with MKBHD, like I love his types of videos. I was like, could I do anything like that? I don't know. Like, maybe one day like so these are types of things that i want to do but like right now vlogging is just the easiest to do because it's like it's the style that you can achieve with the lowest technology possible right it's and it's easier to edit that stuff because i don't know how to use after effects (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's one of the reasons why like i I, you know i was sort of giving you a hard time uh, earlier about not not uploading but i think it's it's like I am aware that I want to see where you go with this because I think even in the few videos that you've uploaded, they are clearly different from each other. Some of them are much more vloggy. Some of them are much more like a technology review. And I think like you are, you are still clearly in the figuring out what you want to do phase. And I think that's interesting to see. Like that's why I want to see like what is the next thing that you're going to put up? Like how does it look? What changes over time? Like I think it's it's it is interesting to see that happen over time like and, and you're you're putting together good interesting episodes uh so it's it's much better that i am harassing you about where is the next mike hurley vlog mm-hmm. as opposed to simply never mentioning it i've just been like that was a fun thing you did <laughs> yeah <laughs> stopped already okay well you know not everything works out <laughs> but that, that would be terrible <laughs> that's not what you want to hear a little thing with with casey neistat though that i, th- I thought was just kind of funny and, and seemed very very Casey, because you're, you're talking about how you don't want to be filming, you know, the plumber in your house. You don't mm-hmm. want to be filming everything all the time. And when I, I got a, a bunch of messages from a bunch of people saying that Casey Neistat had given up the vlog, I naively assumed that he probably had some some message up about how like it was just too much work and it was too tiring and and it was just taking up too much time but of course no because casey neistat is a total machine is like the literal reverse of that yeah where he's he's quitting because doing his daily vlog has just become too easy and too routine i felt yeah. like you gotta be kidding me man <laughs> like i just i just thought that that was that was really funny and and it's just a case of like i am projecting the reasons that i would want to stop doing a thing onto him Right. But yeah. of course, he has entirely different reasons because he's an entirely different person. And, and, and for him, it's like it's just so easy to do these million million view daily vlogs. I really do think it's a little column A, a little column B, though. Like, I genuinely believe that he wants to do more, like that, that there is videos that he wants to make that are more than than daily vlogs and like that, that you can't put together in a day. Mm-hmm. But I also do believe that maybe he just was a little tired of doing it. Yeah, I'm I'm suspecting that it's that he wants to focus on bigger projects. There was a tweet that he posted that really made me smile, which was like so it was like so Casey, something along the lines of like so Casey, what does it feel like to not be uploading daily? And it's just a gif of Zach Galifianakis driving down the highway with the wind in his hair. That's a man who's got a new lease on life right there. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can I can see that. I just I'm thinking like compare and contrast with PewDiePie giving up just his his monthly vlog while he was in LA. I think like it was pretty clear from him that is like that vlog was not doing good things for his life. Oh yeah, right? he was just like <laughs> a broken man. Yeah, that, that was that was terrible and uncomfortable to watch. Uh <laughs> That's also weird for him, right? Like to 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 make a video like that, especially because so much of the content that he makes is making fun of people that do what he did. Right, yeah. Right, which was exactly. to be like this raw emotional person. <laughs> but that but that's why it's like I think the these two these two different very popular well-watched creators had two very different going away messages. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm 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 willing to take 
both of them pretty much at, at, at face value that Casey Neistat probably wants to work on just different kinds of projects and that he w- he felt like the vlog was becoming too routine. And so, something about the daily vlog in L.A. just like broke PewDiePie <laughs> yeah. in, in a way that even his talking around it made it feel even more uncomfortable. Like on, on his return vlog where he where he sort of discusses in a roundabout way uh, giving it up and then returning. It was like, oh, God, it sounded like that was really brutal, man. I am mm-hmm. so sorry. Like, he w- It just didn't fit with him. Yeah, um, I mean, I have a, a million theories as to why that is, right? I just, I just think he put too much effort into it. Like the the years previous, I watched all of those, and they were su- they were more like what I make, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's just like he's got his phone and he's just talking and he's just walking around and it's like whatever. But this time mm-hmm. he like brought two people with him. They tried to make it this big thing out of it. They made challenges. Like I think they he put too much in. Hmm. Um, and uh, maybe he didn't see the return from it, and that was upsetting. And then. It was just too much weighing on him. That's that's an interesting theory. I haven't actually watched the most recent ones. When you mentioned on a previous episode about how he had done this uh, a year ago, I was I've been working my way through the back catalog of two years ago PewDiePie being in LA and yeah. just kind of talking about his daily life. And and again, I really like those. Like there's there's something that's just interesting about seeing this person talk about their life. I think the key difference from from those to this one is is. Those vlogs were Felix. Hmm. Right? He was living his life. In these ones, I think he was trying to be daily PewDiePie. Hmm. It was hmm. way more like the the PewDiePie from his studio in the real world. Right, right. As opposed to just Felix living his life. Which is what I like to see more of. Um, because, I, you know... I think it's funny. I see this in the Reddit where like people are like, "Look at Mike and Gray discovering who PewDiePie is," which it is kind of <laughs> hilarious. But I, I think it's because both of us are kind of fascinated in Felix, I, and I, I, I will butcher his surname. I can't say it's, it's like Kjalberg or something. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of just fascinated in his, the way that he approaches things, because I consider him to be an incredible businessman. Mm-hmm. But I just think people don't see it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We've we've said it a, a hundred times, but it, I, I really feel very strongly about that. That he is dismissed as a clown, and, and people don't see the cleverness in lots of the stuff that he is doing. And so, yeah, that that's why that's one of the reasons why I find him very interesting to watch. It's like dismissed as a clown, actually a genius. Which is why, like the the the, the vlog, the Birdabo thing, it had elements of his genius in it. But I think the problem was, is it was too much creation. It was trying to sustain that that level out in the real world, trying to make things happen. I think it ended up maybe being too much. Yeah. And let's also just mention, while filming a television show. Yep. Which seemed to be incredible. Like, again, when if you compare the videos, like, and even he talks about this, like, that the scared PewDiePie, it's a much larger production now. Hmm. And it like they showed some clips of it and it really does I mean, I haven't seen Scared PewDiePie because I live in the United Kingdom, so we don't deserve YouTube Red. Yeah, not for us. Uh but just from the comparing and contrasting like the shots of the sets from year to year, um hmm. that what he was able to show, it looks more like he's actually shooting a real T V show or a movie. Interesting. That's interesting to hear. So I think that mm. it may be, that maybe took him by surprise as well, I think. Yeah, I just, I cannot imagine, I mean, this is again, this is why these are people at the absolute top of their game, but it's like the the amount of incredible work and effort that, that Casey Neistat and PewDiePie do is just like, is incomprehensible to me. Uh, like you're filming a TV show while also trying to do a daily vlog. Like even if you had to give up halfway through, I'm still astounded that you could do it at all. Like yep. it's, 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 a, it's un, it's just unreal. Uh, but it's like, but it's, this is also why you're at the top of your game, right? Like why you have 5 million or 44 million subscribers, right? It's, it's astounding. He's close to 45 now. <laughs> I mean, does it even matter? No. Right. I mean, like, at this point, it's like uh, uh, it'll only be remarkable when he crosses a hundred million. What I get why we're going down this this train. You want to talk about someone who is a victim of the algorithm? Yeah, 
like look at PewDiePie, right? You know, his videos they they tend to range in like the two and a half to three million. Where is the full, where, where are the forty seven million more? Like you can assume that there is a percentage of them that are not real or people that don't use YouTube anymore. But like those statistics are so wildly off because like his view numbers aren't increasing massively, but his subscriber count continues to grow. It's a thing that doesn't make sense. And he is a fantastic example of it not making sense. Yep. Like I don't, I, I don't understand. It's like, <laughs> his current pictures, <laughs> his current avatar on YouTube <laughs> is Mark is Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's just I don't know how he always manages to pick something that's just funny. Like I yeah. don't know why it's so funny, but it just is. Yeah, but it, talking about that algorithm and it's like I look at PewDiePie and it's like all of your videos should have 10 million views, right? It doesn't if these subscriber numbers keep going up, I don't understand what's happening. Like why people are cycling through the system like this. It just you know, I I would just so I would so love to be able to understand what the algorithm is up to and understand like Okay, but you have, you have millions and millions of people subscribing to see this guy's videos, but his actual video viewership numbers stay remarkably consistent. It's it's weird, like it's very strange. I I only ever look at this and think it's like arrogance on YouTube's part. What do you mean? You are showing an intent. You are saying I want to see this person's videos, and they're like, no, we'll we'll show you what you need to see. Mm hmm. Don't worry. Don't don't worry about that. Like, don't worry yourself. Like, we got you. Forty nine million people said yes. Please let me see this person. Let's say that twenty five million, right? Let's say twenty five million people in the world have said I want to see PewDiePie's videos, mm -hmm. and YouTube are like, we'll show you what you need. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a strange thing, and it and it is this weird, uh, as discussed many times, this, this feeling of like YouTube puts a lot of emphasis on the subscriber numbers and in in my mind they're a number that is very hard to understand what it what it still means right it's like i don't and understand the, the part of it where it continues to get weirder for me is i don't think i miss any of the videos to the channels that i subscribe to so like i don't know what the rest of the world is seeing <laughs> yeah you don't know you don't know what's happening <laughs> no like is it because like is it like a self-perpetuating thing? Is it because I always watch the videos of some of the channels I subscribe to that therefore I always see them? Like, I don't know. It's it's so confusing. Yeah, it, it is very confusing. I, I did notice, though, like, again, this is this is one of the cases, of, like, if you pay attention, you can see the algorithm picking stuff for you, where on, on my account, where I actually have, a, like, a ton of uh, channels that I'm subscribed to, I, I noticed, like, boy, I haven't seen a video from a couple of people in a while. And I went and looked through and it's like, yeah, sure enough, YouTube just, just decided for whatever algorithmic reason that I no longer wanted to watch whatever channel, right? And I click on it and I see, oh, they, oh they've uploaded five videos and I've seen none of them. Uh, it's like, so it's like, this is, this is clearly a thing. Like, it obviously is a thing that YouTube is deciding what you want to see. Uh, and and uh, it was just weird to notice to notice from that other end, like, oh, okay, here's a case where I am subscribed to a few people's channels, but I would be showing up as a kind of fake subscriber because YouTube decided for whatever reason, like, oh, we're not going to actually show you their videos anymore on, on that home screen. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, well, we'll all just cross our fingers. It's the other side of what I consider to be an amazing thing, right? Like, I can open YouTube anytime now because I'm putting more time into it and there's mm -hmm. always something. Mm -hmm. There's always something. Yeah. But then on the flip side of it, there's stuff that they're taking away. <laughs> Although while we are talking about subscribers, I do I do want to quite seriously congratulate you on crossing the 10,000 subscriber threshold. Thank well you. Well done there, Mike. I am really pleased about that. I am really should be pleased super about pleased that. about that. It's a lot faster than I would have expected, genuinely, um, mm -hmm. for that to occur. So I, I assume that I, I genuinely think that every single one of those people listens to this show. So I will take this time to thank all of you for subscribing. It really is a very interesting thing. And this is another thing why it's been hard for me mentally to not have anything that I can put mm -hmm. up because I have these people there now that I want to give them the content that they are, that they have shown the intent to see before the algorithm disregards me for all of them. <laughs> right. I think we can safely assume that at this level, there is a high degree of interest in those subscribers and seeing all of your videos. I hope so. 
Yeah, and it and it matches up pretty well because I'm looking I'm looking at your numbers here on vidstatx.com, which I don't know how much you ever looked at your own numbers, but I can see that you ha- you're closing in on a hundred thousand views. Also, quite oh, a milestone. Didn't know that. That's great. You have ninety eight thousand and eleven views right now, and that works out to be an average of just under nine thousand views per video. So I think like that, that's matching up in an indication very clearly that like your subscriber base is very much watching your videos, yeah. right? Like th- those numbers are highly lined up, right? You know, you know, PewDiePie who's <laughs> getting like 5% yeah. of his subscribers to watch those videos. So I think it's interesting to see. I'm flying just below the system. It's not chewing me up yet. Like I'm, I'm still at the level where we're all good. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think it just I just wanted to take a little take a little moment to note that on the podcast. I mm-hmm. think it's 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 really well done. What I'm what I'm waiting for, and for anybody who wants to check on Mike's stats every once in a while on on VidStatX, is you don't yet have a ranking in the system. This is one thing that I have been checking. Oh yeah, you want to see when you get a ranking? I just want to know what level that puts you at. Yeah. So so here is a thing that I think is interesting to see for newer YouTube channels when they begin is on on Vidstat X you can look up any channel and you can see the statistics that they have about it and what's particularly interesting is at the bottom they show you two tables uh one is subscriber ranking and one is view ranking and they'll show you here's your channel here's the 10 channels above you and the 10 channels below you and they'll show like what's the gap between each in terms of subscribers and views and a thing that i always find is fascinating uh and is just a such a reminder of how many youtube channels there are is how long it takes for there to even be a difference between the channels above you and the channels below you so for example if you are a youtube channel and you have like 3,333 subscribers. Well, it turns out there's like hundreds of YouTube channels that have that exact number of subscribers. And it actually takes quite a while before you start getting into the range where you have a unique number of subscribers. And it looks like you are right on that range right now, that that just over 10,000 is where the numbers start actually being a little bit close to different. As of today, when we're recording, there are only five YouTube channels in the world with 10,147 subscribers. <laughs> right. <Woo-hoo. laughs> but like, I, I think it's really interesting to see, and, and what this is evidence of is, is a power law distribution, that like there's a small number with a large number of subscribers, but that you you mentally underestimate the enormity of the numbers on the other end of the spectrum. Yep. Uh, but it's like, I, I find that fascinating that yep. even with 10,147 subscribers, there are five other channels that have that exact number of subscribers. And so I, I'm curious to see when you get a ranking on VidStatX. Where, yeah, and, I'm, I'm like so eager. To see, where, yeah. does it, where do I show up? Like, how many hundreds of thousands am I off the top, you know? Yeah, like, I, I don't know when it begins, and I wonder if it begins when you actually get into the numbers of uniqueness, right? Like, like where do you mm. get mm-hmm. a unique listing for the number of subscribers? Uh, honestly, I, <laughs> I would be surprised if it happened before a six-figure number. Yeah, but, but the thing is, with the power law distribution, the, like, the slope keeps increasing. And so I right. think if you are already in the range where we're, we're looking at a table and we're seeing, okay, yes, 10 above and 10 below, we're already beginning to see a couple of people with unique numbers. Okay. I think you, you close in on unique numbers faster. Right. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if by the time you get to 12,000 at the latest, that you're actually looking at a table of 20 subscribers above and below. Everybody has a unique number of subscribers. Okay. Um. But I do, I do think like it's, it is just so interesting to see, and like uh, e- even on the view, the view ranking thing here, there's another channel that has the exact same number of views as you, right? Like ninety eight thousand and eleven views. It's like, well, there's one other channel that has that exact number of views, <laughs> right? But it's just, it, I, I guess what, what what I'm trying to get here is like it's just 
the size of YouTube is mind bogglingly large. Like it's just incomprehensibly large at all scales. And I, I find that just I find that just fascinating. This 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 real feeling like the YouTube world is so much bigger of a planet than the TV planet ever was. And it's yep. it's huge at all scales. Like th- that was the thing I was also just so aware of at VidCon was was this this weird phenomenon of running into and talking to people who have channels with sometimes millions of subscribers and it's like i have no idea who you are (laughs) like i've never heard of you and like but it's just like our our little worlds don't don't overlap and it's just enormous the kind of the size that youtube is at i can't conceive of there ever being a platform that could be more bigger and vibrant than this it is very hard to imagine another platform ever dethroning this just just because of the huge size of it and all the the inertia that that implies it's like what else could there be right yeah you know like in forms of entertainment there have been all of them and there there Mm -hmm. are there are democratized platforms for all of them Mm -hmm. right anybody can have a blog anybody can have a podcast like these things exist they are audio and written word Mm -hmm. and and now everybody can put themselves on camera or they can make videos and it's it's clear that the game is over. The video platform won, mm-hmm. but only one website, only one platform out of this entire genre is there, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's YouTube or nothing. Yeah, which yeah. is the also the the weird thing compared to other mediums. Everything else is a, is there is more balance, right? Or like there is the ability for somebody to own their own corner of the internet for this. Mm-hmm. You, but no, it's YouTube. You're either on YouTube or you're not on YouTube. Yeah, it's it's very it's very interesting to see, and it's very interesting to think about, and and the the dominance of it is striking. And checking up on your channel stats occasionally just reinforced quite strongly in my mind, just like how how many YouTube channels there are, mm-hmm. uh, just just from that self-similarity thing, of like, and how long it took to even to even see a point where it's like 7,543 subscribers. is like, yes, but there's at least 20 other channels with that exact same number. Like, it's crazy. It's it's crazy incomprehensible, uh, just, just how enormous it is. Yep. But you're rising fast in those ranks, Mike. Oh, yeah? You'll have a, you'll have a ranking number soon. I can't wait. People keep an eye on it. Tweet Mike when he gets his ranking. Yeah, tell me. I want to know. Yeah, get screenshots. I want to see. Today's episode is brought to you by Tracker. With smart cars, smartphones, and smart homes in our lives these days, technology is making everything smarter. But losing your possessions can make you feel less than smart. This is where Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. Tracker is a coin-sized device that locates misplaced keys, wallets, bags, computers, even pets in seconds. Just pair the tracker to your smartphone, attach it to any item, and find its precise location with the tap of a button. It is that easy. You can track up to 10 devices at once with your phone. And what if you lose your phone? Well, all you need to do is just press a button on your tracker and your phone will chime even if it's on silent. With over 1.5 million devices out there in the world, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network around. So your lost item shows up on a map even if it's miles away. The Tracker app records your lost item's last location on their map, and when another Tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of it, you'll receive a GPS update of your item's location so you know if it's on the move or you can get an even better idea of the precise location. And now you can personalize your Tracker as well with a laser-engraved message or custom-printed image. And Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth LE, so the battery lasts up to one year. I am very happy with my tracker devices because they give me the peace of mind that I need for some of my most important items. I put them in my bags and in my luggage because they contain all of my important things when I'm out on the road. The tracker is so small I can put it in a tiny pocket or I can clip it to something. It's super simple and I just never need to worry about where my stuff is going to be. With tracker, you'll never lose your possessions again. Go to thetracker.com and enter the promo code Cortex to get a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R dot com and code Cortex with any purchase to get your free Tracker Bravo. Thank you so much to Tracker for their support of this show and Relay FM. 
This is a last call for t-shirts, Gray. Last call for t-shirts. We are currently selling Cortex t-shirts with the lovely monkey brain on them. They will mm-hmm. be available until December the 8th, and then they're gone. All right, people. Very little time. Mm-hmm. You got to buy Cortex monkey brain t-shirts for you, for every member of your family for Christmas. Yep. For everyone you know for Christmas. Yep. People you don't know. <laughs> yes. People you don't know. Mike is very encouraging yep. of all of the people. Get them a monkey brain t-shirt. We have lots of colors. So, you know, you could have more than one color <laughs> if you wanted, like if you really want. It's a really nice t-shirt. It really is. It really is. I have to say, it's. I think it's a nice design. It's nice colors. It's helping out a really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> again i will i would i would just like to state i'm okay everything's mm-hmm. fine uh it's just very expensive time in my life and it would be really great if you like the look of this t-shirt if you can buy one i would we, we would really appreciate that yeah they're fantastic looking all the colors you could possibly want yep us and eu distribution there'll be links <laughs> in our show notes you can go and buy them do you hear that? He's doing everything he can, people, right? Yeah. If you if you live in the EU, if you live in the US, we've got men's t-shirts, we've got women's t-shirts, right? Like ev- everything that you could possibly want. If you like dark colors, if you like bright colors, <laughs> whatever it takes. <laughs> whatever it takes, there's a Cortex Cottage t-shirt with your name on it and the name of all the strangers you might interact with that you could also buy t-shirts for. We had a few people try and fix your... VIP problem from the last episode. Oh, did we? Yeah, a few people wrote in with this, but I will credit Ryan. He was the first person uh, to to write in about this. There is an there is an option that you could do to create a uh, smart folder on your Mac in the Mail app, where the rule is that if an email has come from contacts, you can keep them all in one folder. So the the rule is if from contacts, put in this folder. And that could be a way for you to get around this VIP problem that if an email has come from somebody that is in your address book, you will get it. Okay, so I am not familiar with how to do this in terms of from contacts because back when I was much more of a Mac user than I currently am, I, I did set up a bunch of uh, smart folders to use with mail like and they have a whole bunch of rules that you can do if i open up mail right now on my computer i can see the, the old ones that i used to have which is like here i'm going to click so i can get all of the messages from my personal assistant here are all the flagged messages <laughs> flagging the system i no longer use which is funny to see that i have all of these various ones for different categories of slicing and dicing through the email but there is no from contacts option in terms of of smart folders like this is not actually a thing that exists if i go to new mailbox new smart mailbox right from there is no option to say contact list this is not a thing that exists you can do uh sender is member of group and then create a contact group this is what i was going to go through that my workaround is doing exactly this (laughs) sender is member of group and I have a group which is called All Contacts that just every once in a while I throw all the contacts into it, right? <laughs> so it's like, this is sender is member of group All Contacts, right? And then it's okay, great. Now I can pull out all the people who are my contacts. However, as always with this stuff, th- this gets back to the this weird problem of, well, that's great and all, uh, but I tend to prefer to work on my iPad. And a thing that... I don't even I don't even want to know how many years this is now for, but wh- whenever it was that Apple had these these smart mailboxes and smart folders, which you can also do in iPhoto, I remember thinking, "Oh great, these will be on iOS any day now." And it's been like 5 years, 6 years. I don't know how long it's been exactly, but it has been forever that you cannot have these smart mailboxes synchronize over to ios and it's 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 crazy to me so even if i do construct on mail on my computer a smart mailbox that says like oh yes just show me all the contacts there's no way to synchronize that over to mail on ios 
And as my own, my own personal frustration is I used to run my whole photo management system with a series of smart folders that would kind of pull up photos that I needed to to look at and sort through and like, okay, here are photos that I need to edit. And I had this whole system for being able to go through my photos. And, I, and, and for the last many years, I have just totally given up even trying to organize photos on my devices because it's like, well, I can't do this with smart folders. You won't have smart folders on iOS, Apple. I don't understand why, but it's incredibly frustrating and I think weirdly limits the power of these devices. Like, I don't I huh. don't get why this is a thing that has never made it over into iOS. Tell iOS to push that folder is what Ryan told you to do, Gray. Well, I don't understand then what Ryan means by tell iOS to push that folder. You tell Ryan I need more details. I need I need to understand what he's talking about, okay? I'll tell Ryan and then we'll come back and we'll fix your problem. Oh, great, great. I can complain about a thing and then people can tell me technical support. I could I could enjoy that. It's very slow technical support. <laughs> it's just, that's okay. That's okay. There's nothing about my system which is ever fast, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just very delayed, but eventually your problem will be solved. Yeah, I do. I do have to say there there was actually a way that I was sort of self solving a problem with our last episode when I was talking about like this mountain of email that I had to mm-hmm. deal with. I was aware that the very fact of talking about it on a podcast would help motivate me to really try to deal with this a little right. bit better. And because I feel like, okay, I've, I've put it out there in the world that this is a thing that I'm like ridiculously far behind on my email. You've outed yourself. You know? Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to talk about my flaws. And uh, I haven't yet gotten back to inbox zero, but I went from many, many, many messages to right now, I am now under 100 messages left to deal with in my system. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. And as is the case with email, though, I always feel like there is this kind of half-life of it's really easy to go from 1,000 messages to 500 messages and then moderately easy to go from 500 to 250. Mm-hmm. Right? But as, as, you keep, as you keep getting closer, like the messages that are left are either bigger more important or more psychologically hard to deal with for whatever reason so i feel like i'm getting closer to zero but uh so that's a productivity tip for people out there if you ever find that you're behind on email (laughs) just make sure to talk about it on your productivity podcast i just from from working in my old job where I go away for two weeks, you know, with no access to that email and come back and have like 400 unread messages. I just can't mm-hmm. allow myself to live that way anymore. Like, which is why I never take breaks from email. Mm-hmm. And I, I genuinely think I'm better for it. I, I can totally understand that. And, you know, one of the reasons why I talked about it last time is, is also because like, I'm just aware that having fallen out of my system for a while now of, of getting back down to an empty inbox on a regular schedule like that that's not good for me. It hasn't been good to have that in the back of my mind like oh god there's a bunch of crap I have to deal with. Like it's not great and that's one of the reasons why like I'm I am trying to work back toward I'm going to get to the bottom of this email pile and then from then on like it's easier to maintain that. Right? It's just a case of like oh I I let this I let this go for too long and as is the case in in any of this kind of I don't know even want to say like productivity stuff, but I, I you know I'm, I'm always this, this big proponent of like you don't beat yourself up for things, but it is important to observe yourself in a in a kind of non judgmental way and to recognize like oh okay here's a thing that's happened like you've fallen into this pattern and if you think about it dispassionately is this is this a negative effect? And the answer is like, yes. Okay, well, um, let's let's now work to try to fix and remedy this situation. So that's, that's kind of the phase that I am in this right now. It's just like, okay, let's, let's get back to the thing that you know is a better thing. And overall, like that will help all of the other things that you do because it hasn't been helpful to have it just in the back of your mind that there's all these unread messages. Like I have four emails in my inbox right now and uh, I try and keep it below... Like six or seven usually, mm-hmm. and those are ones that are like the back of my mind. There's a couple. There's like two of those where I'm like, I have to respond to that. Right? Like, mm-hmm. This is something I have to respond to. Now I can take that because there's not a lot of stuff around it. Mm-hmm. But if I know that those emails are in there, but there's two hundred 
in between them, mm -hmm. I can't deal with that. Right. So, I mean, you know, this is why I would just get email dealt with. It's it's one of the reasons I have notifications on because I'm able to make snap judgments on emails to archive them without ever opening this inbox, which is like there's 200 messages in here. Mm -hmm. 175 of them can probably just be archived, mm -hmm. especially at this time of the year. <laughs> right. And it's a thing that I think, again, is is when I talk about like observing yourself, like I think it's a really important skill to be able to figure out how, how do you work and what works best for you. And it's a thing that I, I'm, I'm always aware of and I notice when, when we meet up in person is you do get a bunch of notifications. Like you, get, you get so many more notifications than I would ever get. And I would be driven crazy by the way your devices act. But I am also totally aware that you seem on top of it and it seems to clearly work for you in a way that it couldn't possibly work for me and i just i just think yeah. that it's interesting to see but i'm like i'm very aware of like you you know how you work and it's very different from the way that i work but you are also clearly doing a thing that totally works for your system i couldn't i couldn't work knowing things are happening that I can't see. So like, I'm pretty good at, I think, that all of the notifications that come to my phone don't come to my watch. My watch is the only place where I am actively told of notifications. Mm -hmm. And I get the, the majority of what goes to my watch is messages and email, mm -hmm. which works great for me because I'm able to see a subject line and I'll archive an email, which is like, a vast amount of the email that comes in I need to deal with, right? Because a lot of it is I'm never going to respond to this. Like, it's a marketing message. It's like a thanks message. Like, it doesn't, you know, it's stuff that nobody needs to see. But when mm -hmm. you open your email inbox and there's 250 messages in there, you know, like, I need to get through all of this. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm doing, like, a constant triage of my inbox, mm -hmm. right? And, and that really works for me because... I couldn't work in the same way that you couldn't use my system. I couldn't work with your system of mm -hmm. just like, ah, eh, you know, there's like stuff happening uh, and I'll get to it on the schedule that I have assigned for myself as to when this will occur. Right. I couldn't work like that. No way could I work like that. You getting email notifications on your Apple watch and effectively dealing with them right then and there is the thing that I am the most aware of and the most interested to see whenever we meet up in person. Uh, and I just, I find that fascinating because I, to, to me, the, the very idea of like when the Apple watch first came out and people were like, this email notifications on my watch. Like to me, that, that struck me as like almost like a joke. Like no one could possibly want or use this feature effectively. Like this is this is for no human, even if they think it is for them. Like no one can possibly live like this, <laughs> right? But, but it's like, but yet I do know someone that this is clearly super effective for, and 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 that's you. And I just I find that interesting, and I'm always really aware of that whenever we meet up. Like seeing a little message pop up on your watch, and then you just like boop, you deal with it then, and and you can do that without breaking stride. Like, you, you don't break mental stride when you do that, and I, I find that interesting to observe. However, though, for all the good of a system, there is bad of a system. And the, the bad part of my system is when something comes in that can and does break my flow mm -hmm. because it's usually really bad news, mm -hmm. right, of some description or something really frustrating. Now, with the way that I work, that can then break where I am. And, like, you know, like, we could be having a great chat and then I get some terrible news, and then it's like, well, now I know about this terrible news, which I wouldn't know until afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the bad part of the system. Mm -hmm. But in the same vein, it does also happen in the reverse as well. Sometimes something will come in, and it's brilliant, you know. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is this is the thing with all of these systems, right? Is is like none of them are perfect. It's all a question of what trade-offs are you willing to accept right and so i am i am much more willing to accept trade-offs that are like errors of omission like i'm totally aware of the kinds of things that will happen if i'm not 
on top of my communication all the time. And this, this leads to errors of missing a thing. But I know psychologically for me, like I am way happier to deal with those kinds of problems than I am to deal with the problems that, that for me are like distraction or over information problems. Like that's just, that's just the thing that I'm aware of. Like, okay, you have to pick your problem and you pick the problem that you are much more able to deal with. And so it's like, I will lean way higher on that. Like I've missed things. And that's okay. Like, it causes problems. I will accept those problems and deal with them because to me, they're way less bad than I'm getting a bunch of notifications because I find that just, like, fractures my mind in a whole bunch of ways and makes me just not very effective at absolutely anything. But this is where you just have to, you just have to learn about your brain and how you are effective in, in getting done what you need to get done. But in the same way that you observe me, I observe you. And I know that there are things that get to your Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are notifications that you allow through. Like, what is let in? What is let through Like to get to you? This is a whole topic in and of itself, which is notifications, of which listeners might imagine I have a great deal of frustrations. Um, (laughs) But... But but just but just to start it through, uh, like essentially by default, nothing gets any notifications on either my phone or my Apple Watch, and there's really only a very few things that will get through, and all of my notifications now have been turned into silent Apple Watch taps. Like that that is the that is the only way I want to be notified about anything yeah. at this point yeah I, I am in that camp too like i have a lot of stuff go to my phone's lock screen mm-hmm. and then only the things that i really want to come to my watch come to my watch my phone is in permanent do not disturb mode hmm you leave it just in do not disturb all the time that's interesting yeah it's 100 percent of the time my phone is in do not disturb and the only system that will make an alert to me is when when all systems are dormant is my watch so hmm. when all the screens are off, the only thing that will ever break into my life is is my Apple Watch. Mm-hmm. That's why it's actually, I was thinking about it recently, my Apple Watch is now an essential piece of equipment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I, I, was, on the, I was on the edge for a while of like, I like this thing, but I could live without it. But a couple of days ago, I stayed at Cortex Cottage and didn't bring my Apple Watch charger. Mm-hmm. And I was like a 50% so I turned it off, and then the next day we went out with it, but we we went out for dinner that night, and I, for the second time in the time that I've owned the Apple Watch, I had to go into power reserve mode. Mm-hmm. And I was oh, a mess. No. I was a mess. <laughs> because my phone kept buzzing in my pocket, mm-hmm. right? Because I took it off, do not disturb, because it's like, well, now, like, I need to get, I might need to get some notifications, but I just couldn't deal with buzzing in my pocket and having to keep getting out, putting away, keep getting out, putting away, like... Didn't like it. Did not like that at all. And in the same vein, I don't like to have nothing. I don't like. Mm-hmm. I don't like to be completely cut off. So my watch has become really essential because it is like, it is the way that I know that I will always know what's going on if I have to know because my mm-hmm. watch will tell me. It is a fantastic notification device. Right? Like in, in, it's really a, like a notification accessory to the phone, and. For that, it, it, it does a really good job. Like, every once in a while, it still misses notifications, but, mm-hmm. but it's, still, it's still like a real win of making the phone less distracting, having an easy way to see what's occurring, and to be unobtrusively notified about a thing. And you know if that makes the watch worth it for you or not. Like, there are some people that are like, that is ridiculous. And that's because mm-hmm. you don't need this. Right, exactly. There is a specific type of person that's like, yeah, I need one of those. Like, we all knew it. Whereas, like, I need one of those because I need the thing that will let me see my notifications wherever I am and what I'm doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So to answer your, your question from before, I, I, have, I have some frustrations with notifications. And I, I think I can, I can kind of relatively cleanly mentally divide my notifications into two categories which are someone else is trying to get in touch with me about something. And then 
The other category is I am trying to have my phone help me live the life that I want to live in whatever way. So I'm trying to have my phone nudge my own behavior in the correct direction. I said, like, these are the kinds of things. So it's like notifications for other from other people. That's like iMessage and that's from Slack. And then like, I'm trying to nudge my life in the right direction. That is like calendar notifications about what am I supposed to be doing now? Or it's little little reminders that pop up about like, hey, you're supposed to be taking your vitamins at this point in time, right? Or it's like, hey, you know, you're supposed to be going to the gym now, buddy, right? You know that? You know, you're supposed to be going to the gym. Like, I find those kinds of things really helpful and and useful to, you know, I, I, this, is, this is such a hard thing to describe because I think when people hear it, they they imagine that the kind of person who sets up a bunch of these reminders is also just like mechanically doing everything that the phone says. <laughs> like that is not the case, right? But it, what it is, it's it's trying to nudge myself in the right direction about things. And this also includes like work timers. So when I'm, you know, I'm doing like a, a 40 minute working block, right? Like I'm setting a little timer and I find it helpful to be notified when the end of that block comes up. And so th- th- those are the notification categories for me. The-, the problem that I have with the way notifications are set up is that there isn't... Ba- basically, I think Apple really, really would benefit from adding more granularity to the way notifications work. Because, like we were saying before, I'm aware like I can kind of suffer from like, oh, too many people are trying to get in touch with me right now. And I find that stressful. And then it's like, it's sort of hard to deal with. It makes me less effective. And this is one of the reasons why, like over the course of my being self-employed, I have really learned that maximizing my own effectiveness is about having like two phases to the day. The morning when I am closed off from the world and the afternoon when I am much more open to the world. So in the morning, I only want to receive the notifications that I have set up for me. Here's a notification from a timer. Here's a notification to go to the gym. Here's a little calendar appointment about a place that you're supposed to go right now. Messages from me. No, not messages Ah. from you, right? No, no messages from Mike. (laughs) Because like, this is a thing that I was aware of. I I found personally productivity destroying and this is partly a side effect of living in the uk was it was really common to wake up in the morning and see like a bunch of badges in iMessage and slack from other people in america who needed something from me and i, and I was I'm like i was so aware like just seeing those things it was very hard to be like oh I'll look at them later it's like yes but i see the red badge now like i know that there are messages waiting for me and i knew like man if i check those messages I'm going to kind of lose a morning of writing because I'm going to be, I'm like, I'm going to get sucked into whatever this is. And then I'm like, I'm burning my most productive time. So it's the difference between me and you, right? I, the beginning of my day is purposefully built to respond to all of that. Right, right. Yeah, this is, this is a case where we are total opposites. Yep. <laughs> but nonetheless, what it, what it means is like, ideally what I want is to be able to tell my phone, hey, listen, phone, between the time when I go to bed and essentially lunchtime the next day, I don't want to hear from anybody about anything, right? Like, I, I don't want you to beep. I don't want there to be badges. I don't want any kind of indication that anyone in the world is trying to contact me. Leave all of that stuff for the afternoon when I can deal with it without burning the most valuable part of my day. This is more than do not disturb, right? This is like, imagine that no notifications had happened. Right. But here's the problem. In the morning phone, I do want you to send me notifications from some apps in particular, Uh, right? Mm -hmm. So I want, so so for example, I want Do to be able to send me notifications because I use it for work timers and I use it for like nudging timers about like go to the gym, buddy, right? Like that, that kind of thing. And I also want a calendar to be able to send me notifications and OmniFocus and a couple of other things that I'm using like to track stuff oh plus also my uh my uh exercise applications like uh, they need to send notifications for various things so like there's a whole category of stuff that i do want notifications for in the morning so there's 
the option of totally shutting down the phone and saying no notifications is off the table. Like that will not work. That will not be really effective. And so I actually, I have two notifications now that remind me to do the, the, the best payoff for me, which is I manually at night flip the switch to turn off all notifications from iMessage and I don't turn it back on until the afternoon. Why could you not just put your phone into airplane mode? Because it sounds like all the notifications that you want are local notifications. They're not all local notifications. Okay. Uh, wh- one of the problems is do and synchronizing timers across a bunch of devices. Right, I see. Yep. They're local once they've synced. Right, exactly. Yeah. They're, lo- they're local once they've synced. Like, I have... I have attempted to do this with airplane mode and airplane mode gets like most of the way there, yeah, but not all of the way there. And it also totally cuts off the possibility of emergency contact. Exactly. It's too, it's, it's, it's too far. I think Air, airplane mode is good, but it is really draconian. Yeah. And it, you know, <laughs> Air, airplane mode is like, press the button to live like it's the 1800s, right? Mm-hmm. That's what it is. It's like, well, yes, I will have quite a quiet morning if that's the case, uh, but that's, that's too far. And I forget which iOS it was. I think maybe it was iOS 9, but whatever it was after the watch came out, I thought, oh, it's a total no-brainer that Apple's going to introduce greater levels of granularity yep. in terms of notification yep. to iOS. It was one of those things like, you know, everyone likes to play the fun, like what's going to be here in the next iOS release game? Like, this is fun to play. And I was so confident about that. I was like, oh, no brainer, increased notification granularity. And it's like two, three iterations later, it hasn't happened. And I I feel like I know I'm a total corner case with this. But basically, like, even if Apple only introduced the option to tell an app that it is able to override do not disturb... I think that would solve like 80% of the corner cases that people are concerned about. Because I think there there is a class of app that people would want to be able to tell you can override do not disturb and and that would go that would go a long way. Like in my dream world, I would really love to be able to set hours in the way that Slack does. Like Slack lets you say like oh this person will receive no notifications between these various hours. I would love to be able to do that for all of the apps, but I don't know. I, I know I'm a bit of an edge case with this, but I feel like Do Not Disturb is getting a little creaky feeling. Like it, it, it feels like this was made for a much simpler device a long time ago. And it also just has some some weird unexpected behavior about like setting alarms. Like an alarm seem to be able to override Do Not Disturb. And yeah, it's it's a, it's a little showing its age, I think. The alarm thing makes sense to me because one of the primary use cases for do not disturb even the icon displays it is for your phone not to make any noise when you sleep of course of course so alarms have to override it right but what i mean is like would a user expect that an alarm overrides it like i think apple makes the correct choice here right obviously alarm should override do not disturb but it does mean that do not disturb is not is not like a perfect system no. Right, that that there's something weird that's going on there, and and I also always wonder because the app that I use to track my sleep is somehow able to get through the do not disturb notifications. I think because it's running a, a recording, like it's pretending to record all night, but it's not really yeah. doing anything. That's like w- whatever it is, it's able to make my phone beep and wake me up in the morning, like through the do not disturb. Uh, so I just think there's there's just a couple of weird cases of like, huh, this is this is sort of unexpected behavior if I sit down and, and think it through. It's in the same way that like an an alarm will play when the mute switch is on. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I right? didn't know that. Because hmm. it's the same idea. It's like they made the choice because people mute their phones when they go to sleep. Hmm. Like my phone is always muted. <laughs> my phone is always muted and always in do not disturb. I run my phone very weirdly. I do the exact same thing with the sound. It's always mute. It's never it's never not mute. <laughs> Always muted, always and do not disturb. Adina's is is even more nuclear than that. She 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 doesn't even have vibrate on her phone, which seems crazy to me. Like, why would you? But 
yeah, each to their <laughs> own. It, it seems like everybody runs their phones in their own weird little way. Mm. The notifications thing is concerning to me because I think Apple made a big change with iOS 10, which I really do not like. There was an option to show notifications grouped by application and or just all notifications chronologically. Mm-hmm. And they took away the grouping by application, which I cannot even talk about how upset this makes me. <laughs> Because I I used to use my notification center as kind of like a dashboard of what's going Mm -hmm. on in my day. And I would clear off certain notifications as they were not needed. And sometimes that would be an entire application's notifications. But I would still Mm -hmm. leave certain things on there because they're a reminder of what's left to be done. You know, it's like like an extra thing. It's like here is your email inbox. Like here are the things that have come in today that you haven't dealt with yet. Here are the tasks that you haven't cleared off yet. Here's the messages Mm -hmm. that you need to reply but you can't do that anymore because it's like if you've got 12 emails, you either clear them all off singly or you clear the entire day's worth of notifications. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it frustrates me no end. And that's where like a, a choice like that, taking away a, fo- a feature like that genuinely makes me feel like we're not going to get more granular notific- notification support in the near future. I really, I just don't see it because they've, I believe, regressed notif- notifications. They've taken away an option. I can't imagine them adding more. Mm. I I don't use Notification Center very much, but I, I did, I think in one of the old episodes, I mentioned that I, I do have one of my iPads set up uh, so that I could pull down Notification Center and, and use it similarly to the way that you do of like, let me just get an overview of all of the notifications that I have seen. And I had to stop using it after they made this change because like, this is just totally useless to me. Like if I can't group this by application, yeah, it's just like, here's a bunch of random stuff that came in random orders. And it's like, this is not, this is not helpful. Like I don't actually care that I got an iMessage after an email from a VIP. Like this is irrelevant to me, right? What I want to see are emails, iMessages, Slack messages grouped by application. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't just want to see it all spread out throughout the day. And so, yeah, like, I agree with you that I, f- I found that a concerning change. Like, okay, I think you don't have enough granularity in the way a person can handle notifications. And this is not a feature that I use a lot, but the fact that you have removed it is concerning to me. And I don't know, like, I just, I've been thinking about the notifications a bunch because I'm really trying to, I was actually kind of trying to write, like, a little bit of an article about the fussy way that I set up my own notifications and just trying to really like sit down and make the system as perfect as I can make it be and, and like write out, okay, here are all of the cases under which I want to receive a notification from, from this or that, like, what am I going to do? And it just made me aware of even looking at my phone where I feel like I run a pretty clean phone compared to most people, but it's like, man, scrolling through that notification tab, it's forever long, right? Like there's just, so many things that could potentially send you notifications and it just it doesn't feel like like there really is enough there to manage all of the different kinds of urgency these various apps can represent and like i I think a great case for the like an app should be able to override do not disturb is the increasing world of home monitoring equipment right like I'm sure that like there are people out there who would want a notification if their front door opened, if they were traveling, even if their really phone was point. in do not disturb, right? Yeah, like, I, I want to know if my Canary home security camera has detected an intruder. Exactly. That is the most important notification in my life. Right. And, and to like, there should be a way to say like, I want this to overwrite Do Not Disturb. And yes, Do Not Disturb is mostly used for sleeping, but not exclusively for sleeping. And so, it it just feels like this is really a thing that that would be beneficial because the range of apps on your phone can represent a tremendous range of of urgency to you. And and yes, I think that that's that's a that's a great example. Like if if the canary can know there's an unrecognized face in your house, like you want to know immediately, right? And you want to be able to specify that app. We'll just let you get to this in your own time. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. it'll be fine. Don't worry, buddy. You know it, it'll it'll come through eventually when you wake up. It's frustrating, but um, I mean this is this is perhaps a whole other topic for a whole other time. But since since Apple does seem to be in a like let's remove all of the things 
mood. Yeah. I'm, I'm not exactly hoping for, you know, this this relatively insignificant to Apple thing of like increased notification granularity. It's like we're we're busy getting rid of all the stuff at Apple. Like they're they're not going to add anything. So I'm not holding out for that. But I I do I do find it frustrating the conflict between notifications from people in the outside world and notifications from me to myself and my desire to split that over the day into two separate zones like i just i just can't do that as cleanly as i would want i can clearly see the real frustration in this is that they are two completely separate types of notification Mm -hmm. they are things set by you and people trying to contact you yep like that is it's a clean divide and and that's why i can see why this would be so frustrating Mm. i I would also want to be able to specify different people as being more or less important in their ability to reach me yeah it's it's like they do it a little but but not really enough uh and i just think that there's a there's a lot of space to do more stuff here but i'm i'm not expecting any of it Today's show is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron will deliver seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to help you make delicious home-cooked meals. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-proportioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. You get just the right amount of ingredients to create their amazing recipes. You don't have any waste. It's really awesome. You can customize your recipes each week based on your dietary preferences and choose the delivery option that fits your needs best there's no weekly commitment you only get the deliveries when you want them and they deliver to 99 percent of the continental u.s blue apron has established partnerships with over 150 local farms fisheries and ranches across the u.s as a result their seafood is sourced sustainably under standards developed in partnership with the monterey bay aquarium seafood watch their beef chicken and pork comes from responsibly raised animals and their produce is sourced from farms that practice regenerative farming is all really good stuff and talking about good stuff their meals are amazing and they give you everything that you need all these lovely recipe cards to help you make these meals at home and what's more the more you cook with blue apron the more you're going to learn and the more stuff you're going to be able to cook for yourself by yourself you will become a better chef by using blue apron New recipes are created by Blue Apron's culinary team, and they're not repeated in a year, so you're going to get new stuff every single time. You can cook recipes like roasted pork and braised cabbage with barley and glazed apples, Thai green coconut curry with sweet potato and jasmine rice, brown butter and chestnut gnocchi with Brussels sprouts and pea shoot salad. Check out this week's menu and get three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Cortex. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash cortex today. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of this show and Relay FM. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. So we are both MacBook Adorable owners and users now. I'm going to be using my MacBook Adorable to edit this actual episode because mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to be heading over to Cortex Cottage after we record today. Um, you've had yours for longer than mine, and as I'm trying to get used to it a little bit more, I'm interested in understanding what challenges or opportunities are going to lie ahead of me. So how are you finding your time with the, with the MacBook Adorable now? I mean, you've had it for like five months at this point? Yeah, yeah. I was using my MacBook Adorable just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I was actually in the middle of editing a podcast, mm-hmm. and... It blipped off and died just just right in the middle of using it hmm. with like a with like a funny little pop sound and a, and a strange electronic smell. That's fine. <laughs> um, and completely died. Well, <laughs> do you know what day this was, Mike? What day was this? This was literally the morning of the announcement of the new MacBook Pros. Hmm. So what you're telling me was that your MacBook Adorable died on the day I bought mine. (laughs) 
I didn't realize that was the same day. I bought it on the day that they announced the MacBook Pro. <laughs> you knew what I was going to do that day. We'd spoken about this. You knew that I was making my decision that mm-hmm. day. Could you not maybe just told me? I, I think it didn't cross my mind. I was busy mm-hmm. that day with mm-hmm. something. I can't remember what it was. You're editing a podcast, it sounds. Yeah. Oh yes, that's right. Of course, of course. I forgot. I was in. I was in a real rush, and I, and I ended up having to like switch locations and uh, get home to my iMac. And I remember I was watching the. That's right. I was watching the event in mute on my computer while I was actually busy editing the the podcast that I needed to 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 finish up by a particular time. Uh, so I had, I had the the event in the background just silently playing as I was trying to edit on my main machine. That's not good, man. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. And uh, the people at Apple did a little shrug emoji when I brought it in. They're like, what's going on with this machine? They're like, there's nothing we can do to fix this. Like, we have no idea what happened. And so, long story short, like, I wasn't, I was trying to figure out, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do about this? Um, I, I wasn't quite sure, like, am I going to just replace this machine i was i was trying to figure out what i was going to do if you've bought one of those macbook pros it should be gray <sighs> that is exactly what happened oh for god's sake why do you do this to me <laughs> you let me down this path i never would have bought this machine i would have bought the macbook pro you you led me down this path you stood behind me in an apple store in san francisco and told me it was the computer for me we've had conversations since that point about optimizing for thinness optimizing for lightness you drilled into me this idea that my computer had to be the thinnest and lightest that it had to be and now yours exploded i bought one and then you bought the new one yeah that's what happened what one did you buy well this, this was all sort of like, I just need to preface this by saying this was, this was all very last minute. I, uh-huh. I was, I was really just going to kind of leave it for a while because I, I'm in the, the situation of, I don't really need a laptop and I, I, I essentially I didn't think that I needed to get it, but it turns out that I've actually ended up doing far more traveling than I expected to and I'm I'm going to be doing some more traveling and so I was like oh actually I need to get a laptop right now because there was a trip I was doing and I needed to have a machine to edit a podcast for a deadline so I was like okay well what am I going to do and so what I have is I have a MacBook Pro on a trial run this this is what I'm doing is I'm I'm giving this one a trial run and I got the 13 inch machine uh, the version with the touch bar. Oh, so this why is, are you doing this? This is what I have as well. No, my see, computer. this is this is unacceptable now. Why is it? Why? Are you why so, did I, you like, buy that one? There's no point. Why did you do that? Why are you so angry? Why, because you you pushed you me into you. <laughs> why did you buy the one with the touch bar? You don't need that. It was it was in the store. Like I literally just went into the store. I was like, "What what computers do you have? I need a computer right now." Yeah, but they also have the one without the touch I'm, bar. I'm traveling in twelve hours. <laughs> they also I have the a, one. They I probably have more of the ones with the buttons this, on them. This very moment. No, I am not happy. And the guy was like, "Oh, we have the ones with the buttons, and we have the one with the touch bar. It just came in this morning." And I was like, "Oh, really? Okay, let me try that one." That's that's how the conversation went. Mm-hmm. There was no like. Ooh, I want to try the one with the touch bar. That didn't enter your head at any point? Oh, yeah, I would like to try it. You decided to, sight unseen, go for a computer with a new interaction paradigm you'd not use. That sounds like something you would make that decision to do. No, you saw the new shiny thing, and you decided (laughs) to buy that. Because what you could have done was just go, well, I had a bad MacBook, I'll just get another one of those. Yeah, I could have gotten another MacBook. That, that like that's that is totally is totally an option, God. right? But I, I thought like, oh, let me just let me try this thing because there there was a single problem with the the MacBook Adorable that was an issue for me, which was that I couldn't edit podcasts consistently at two X. That I think it's it's a it's a problem with mm, logic okay. because the MacBook Adorable, when I first got it, could do podcasts with logic at 2x. But then there was some update and and whatever they changed, 
the MacBook Adorable couldn't handle it. So if I set it to 2x, it would crap out. To be honest, that that really does seem like something that would push that machine more than is is comfortable. That's, it's asking a lot then, because that is you know you're using a pro app on a machine that has no fan, and then you're saying do everything you're doing twice as fast. <laughs> right, exactly. Like it's <laughs> it's it's really not fair. And I never do this, so that's one good thing. I guess. Oh, really? Okay, that's interesting. So that's that's a difference in our workflow. See, I, I am I am constantly editing it to x right but we edit differently though right yeah that's true i only ever do like these first run edits where i have to listen to everything and and fine tune i never do these like pass throughs that you do yeah so so this is part of my workflow is i want to do really fast pass throughs to hear stuff and even when i do final edits uh there are sections where i know i can listen to this at 2x and and just try to fix a few little minor things. I don't have to listen to this at actual speed. Yep. So the 2x is really important to me. And whatever it was in the last update with Logic, like it just couldn't handle it and it would crap out. And I found that really frustrating. And then and you pop the processor and... <laughs> yeah, I'm like, maybe, maybe that's actually <laughs> what it was because I did keep forgetting and try to like crank it up to 2x and then the machine would oh, crap out and be like, yeah, yeah. oh, okay. Like I'd grind it back down to 1.2 and feel like I was, you know... A snail editing my yeah. podcast. I mean, maybe that is actually what broke whatever was inside. <laughs> I, never, I never made that connection, but you may very well be right that I fried some circuit by trying to do the podcast at 2x constantly. You may have overheated it or something. Seriously, that, you know, I don't know enough about how this stuff works, but like this thing, it, it just gets hot. That's all it does. That's all it can yeah. do. It gets very hot. But nonetheless, I was seriously considering, do I replace this machine or do I try the Pro? And this is why, like, I feel very solidly that, like, I have the Pro on a kind of trial right now. I'm just seeing how it is. I'm trying to use it a bunch. I did use it while traveling. And there's a lot to not like uh, ab- about that machine. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what are, what are the trade-offs here that I'm willing, that I'm willing to pay, right? Like, there's, there's always going to be a trade-off. And with the adorable, the trade-off is it will take me longer to edit podcasts. But am I willing am I willing to take that versus with the 13-inch MacBook Pro, the increased size and weight of the device? Like is is this a thing that I'm willing to do the trade-off? And I don't know. I don't know. One of the biggest trade-offs of this machine, like of this MacBook Pro, doesn't affect you which is the ports, the changes in the ports, because you've lived that life already. Yeah, that is true. If anything, you have now have more, right? <laughs> you've lived the life of one USB-C port for a long time. Now you have four Thunderbolt 3 ports, which are better ports, and you have four of them, right? So that's, a, you know, that is this isn't an issue for you, this part. Yeah, I could record a podcast and charge at the same time. Well, I can do that because I took a trip down to Dongletown. <laughs> <laughs> you don't always know when you need to go to Dongle Town, right? That's part of the problem. Well, but, so here's my solution. <laughs> I have a, a thing that Anchor make where it's like USB pass through for power. Mm-hmm. So that just never comes off the power cable. Mm-hmm. My power mm-hmm. cable has a permanent dongle attached to it with four USB ports on it. Hmm. Now look at you, Mr. Fancy Pants. So I never have to make that that trade-off you're the mayor of dongle town so what don't you like about the macbook pro then is it the, the, the weight and the thickness because i because i i have handled them i went to the store and i picked them up i haven't seen the one with a touch bar yet but the one without which is like the same thickness the same same mm-hmm, weight that mm-hmm. kind of thing and i picked it up i was like no this is this is too heavy and too thick like yeah. this is this is not what i'm looking for because you had goaded me into getting the macbook Okay, now now you're using provocative language by saying I goaded you. You stood behind me in a store right. and you were whispering, buy it in my ear. That is literally true. And <laughs> it was the correct decision. Yes. Like, <laughs> I don't know how much more you can goad somebody into that no, but decision. That's, no, it's not goading. It's guiding. Right? This is totally different. You, totally different. It's guiding yep. you towards a correct decision. Um, but no, you you are right that it's it's... It's a funny thing, but boy, picking up the MacBook Pro after having used that tiny little adorable, 
it feels like it might as well be that old 17 inch computer that Apple used to make. <laughs> it's just, it, it is significantly heavier and significantly thicker. And, and that is by far and away the thing that I like about it the least, because if I'm using a computer while traveling, I'm using it for very specific circumstances. And it's like, I'm, I need to edit something and that's what I'm going to use it for. And like, I don't necessarily want to ca- carry around a heavier device. The other thing that I've noticed with it, because I've been trying to use it to get a real sense of like, what do I think about this machine is good God is the battery life all over the place. Like it, it is, it is not a machine I would ever want to have to use without it being plugged in. This is a, uh, a, a common complaint, but not a consistent complaint of this machine. Hmm. It's it's been no one seems to have really nailed down what's going on here, but the battery life tests and stuff from the reviews are all over the map. Hmm. That's interesting to hear. Yeah. That's that's very interesting to hear. Some people have found it amazing, some people have found it abysmal. Yeah. I, I will put it at seemingly very inconsistent. Hmm. Uh is is what I feel like. I, I spent uh the other day just trying to get a get a sense of it. And I I was doing what I would regard as pretty light work which is I had Ulysses open and Evernote and I was doing some writing and some researching and from fully charged down to the little battery warning, I think I got like four hours out of the thing. And it's like, this is, this seems like pretty bad battery life. Uh, (laughs) No way. It's like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm really stressing you machines. Like you have, you know, you're updating text files in Dropbox and you know, whatever the hell Evernote does, you know, not making enough notebooks, like whatever it's busy doing. I, I, and <laughs> it doesn't seem like I should be dropping the battery this much, but I, but I totally was. And then I'm wondering like, is it the touch bar? Like, is that, is that what's causing this to happen? Like, I don't know. The touch bar seems to like to shut itself off whenever it possibly can. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny little machine. I think when it is plugged in, it's totally fine. It's it's heavier than I would want, but like using it traveling when it's just sitting on the desk and I have it plugged in and I'm using it under those circumstances, I was aware of, I'm glad to have this machine with me now. It's clearly more powerful and even just a little bit of screen real estate increase is helpful and nice. Uh, like I was playing around with Adobe After Effects, and and that is that is a case where like boy, having a little bit of a bigger screen really does make a difference. Uh, if I'm doing any kind of animation work on this, but if I'm using it away from a power cable or when I'm actually packing it in my bag, then I don't like it so much. So I'm not I'm not quite sure what I think of this thing yet, but I, I felt the need to tell you since you're always like, hey, aren't mm. we MacBook adorable buddies? Like, well, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, I've very much enjoyed using my MacBook Adorable so far. I've edited a few podcasts on it. Mm -hmm. But now I guess I'll just wait for it to go pop. Cortexmas is nearly upon us. Mm. The annual, biannual, triannual? This is the septa annual, right? It's it's the septa annual annual holiday. Septa annual Cortexmas is nearly upon us. The original Cortexmas happened over the the christmas period Mm -hmm. and it is it is coming it's coming fast and it's proved so popular it Mm -hmm. happens many times a year yep at least in my head exactly exactly (laughs) Uh, so i would like to do something special for our final episode of the year which is next episode Mm -hmm. i would like to do an all ask cortex episode Ooh! so i would like our listeners to tweet at us using the hashtag ask cortex or leave comments in the Reddit that are questions, and you can address them to me in the Reddit, so I'll see them all. And I'm going to collect up a host of really interesting questions from our listeners to round out 2016 with. So send them in, and we'll talk about them next time. 